Have you ever seen ferrofluid? You know that awesomely cool looking black sludgy stuff that makes fantastic geometric shapes? If you've ever seen a video of ferrofluid in action, you may wonder if it's alive or from outer space, kind of like a real life version of the Venom symbiote, you know, from the Spider-Man universe. Spider-Man universe? Well, sadly, ferrofluid isn't alive or from outer space, but it was made for outer space. So what exactly is it? All right, let's science. Ferrofluid is a colloidal liquid, which means it's a mixture of two substances, but one isn't soluble in the other. Think of the milk in your fridge. You know how sometimes the creamy part separates from the liquid? You shake it back up to mix it together, but the fatty, creamy part doesn't technically dissolve when you do that. It turns microscopic and kind of just floats around in what's called the carrier fluid. In this case, the rest of the milk. In ferrofluid, however, the tiny suspended particles are nanomagnets. More specifically, teeny tiny bits of metal, usually magnetite. Magnetite is the most magnetic of all naturally occurring minerals on Earth. It's also known as ferromagnetic material because it is both attracted to magnets and can be magnetized and turned into a permanent magnet itself. So the simplest explanation is that ferrofluid is basically a big liquid magnet. Those hedgehoggy spiky things you see, that's the magnetic nanoparticles responding to the magnetic fields around it. Now, if these tiny magnets are attracted to the magnetic fields around them and to each other, why wouldn't all those nanoparticles join together inside the liquid, create one big clump of metal, and escape the liquid base? Typically, when you dissolve something in a solution, you get one atom or molecule of the dissolved substance surrounded by the solvent, and then another somewhere else, and another somewhere else, and another somewhere else. You get the picture. They're all in there, but only one at a time. No two are joined together. So when you have even as few as 10 soluble atoms together inside a solution, those 10 atoms or molecules would sink to the bottom of the solution and just sit there. But we're dealing with a colloidal liquid here, so that's not gonna happen. What we need is some sort of shell or barrier around each of these nanoparticles that will keep them from bonding to one another, sort of like a bumper car or a bubble. Does something like that even exist? Yes, it does. What we're describing here is known in chemistry as a surfactant. A surfactant is a compound that reduces surface tension when dissolved in water or water-based solutions. That's a lot of fancy talk. Let's apply this concept to our day-to-day -day lives. To do this, we need to talk about hydrophobic and hydrophilic bonds. Hydrophilic means water-loving, and hydrophobic means water-fearing, or more easily said, it repels water. All surfactants have two things in common. One end of the surfactant molecule is a long tail that is hydrophobic, and the other end of the molecule is hydrophilic. One of the most commonly seen examples of a surfactant molecule is hand soap. Have you ever wondered why we use soap to get our hands clean of oils and dirt? Well, if you haven't, that's too bad, because I have wondered that, so we're gonna cover it right now. So. We've established that soap is a surfactant with a hydrophobic end and a hydrophilic end. When soap is dissolved in water, like when you wash your hands, the soap molecules form spheres around the oil and dirt particles. The hydrophobic tails turn inward, surrounding the oil and dirt particles, while the hydrophilic end points toward the water. Once the oil and dirt particles are trapped in this enclosed sphere, called a micelle, the soap rinses right off without giving the oil and dirt anything on our skin to grab a hold of, it just slips off. Whereas if you had regular water and no soap, the oil wouldn't separate from where it was stuck. So, back to our milk example. If we give a squirt of lemon juice to milk, you'll not only have literally the worst tasting milk ever, but you can see it clumps up. It splits into curds and whey. Little Miss Muffet, that's how you know curds and whey. You'll have a clear solution on top. The clumps are milk fat coming out of the solution, but why? Wasn't milk a colloidal liquid? We already covered that, Bradley. Yes, you're right. But because the citric acid in the lemon juice has disturbed the outside of the colloid in such a way that the milk fat aggregates and falls out of the solution. Taking this concept back to ferrofluids, what keeps our ferrofluid solution a colloidal one is the surfactant around the metal nanoparticles. So about 5% of the overall species can become magnetized without a magnetic field. Species here meaning the ferrofluid. With the surfactant, it ends up being about 10 to 15% of the total solution. 
A hundred million percent satisfaction guaranteed. Satisfaction all day. So 85 to 90 percent of the ferrofluid is the oil base, and 5 to 10 percent is the surfactant surrounding the magnetic nanoparticles. Only 5 percent of ferrofluid is magnetic at all. And at this point, it shouldn't be any surprise to know that the surfactant in ferrofluid isn't that much different than the chemical and household detergent that's used to remove stains. When ferrofluid is exposed to a magnet, the magnetic particles inside the fluid line up and emulate the shape of that magnetic field around them. We see that shape because of the fluid they are encased in. Ferrofluid has just the right amount of viscosity for how strong the magnetic elements are. Viscosity meaning how thick a liquid is. Think of honey. Honey is still a liquid, but it's a very viscous liquid. That viscosity of the base liquid makes sure it can hold on tight to those tiny magnetic particles. And when they made this ferrofluid, it was made to be just viscous enough to take the shape of the magnetic fields. Any EDM fans in the house? Doesn't that look exactly like Dead Mouse? But not too watery to allow itself to fall apart or allow the magnetite to escape out of the matrix of the base oil. So it's like they're trying to get out of that liquid, but they just can't seem to break it and get sucked right back in. Between the viscous nature of the oil and the surfactant, those magnetic particles aren't going anywhere. The nanoparticles orient and align themselves to the closest, most powerful magnetic field applied, which is why you see those spiky, hedgehoggy patterns emerge from the ferrofluid. They're showing us the shape of the magnetic field the ferrofluid is exposed to. All of those itsy bitsy magnets suspended together create the overall shape of the magnetic field. But if a magnetic field isn't introduced to them over a long period of time, could those particles encased in the surfactants eventually sort themselves out and sink or sift to the bottom? No. Generally speaking, particles in colloidal liquids are about the same size, between 10 and 100 nanometers wide. To give you some frame of reference, the thickness of a human hair is around 100,000 nanometers. So these particles in ferrofluid are small. An atom is usually one-tenth of a nanometer across. So 10 nanometers would be 100 atoms across. And 100 nanometers would be 1,000 atoms across. Whoa, that is 1,000 Adam Sandlers. Very, very tiny, but referenceable. So when we're talking about nanoparticles this small, especially in relation to colloidal liquids, we're now dealing with quantum physics. In ferrofluid, the magnetic particles naturally disperse somewhat equally on their own. This is due to a phenomenon known as Brownian motion, which states that nanoparticles don't abide by the same physical laws we know to be true, like falling down, bumping into my desk, spilling my drink, stubbing my toe. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty clumsy. Instead, because of their mass, the motion of the liquid they are suspended in is enough force to keep them from settling to the bottom of the liquid. Dr. Robert Brown, an English botanist, discovered the pollen grains suspended in liquid didn't move the way he thought they should. In fact, it was much more erratic. It didn't seem to make any sense. This irregular motion is now named after him. So while it may seem like the nanoparticles are moving chaotically and on their own, they are in fact simply interacting with all the other particles in the base liquid on a quantum level, just not all at once and not with the same force. Okay, so anyone can buy this amazing stuff to drip it down the threading of a screw or hold a magnet above it and watch it go wild. And that's great. It teases our concepts of how liquids react to their environment. But how was ferrofluid discovered? Well, it wasn't. Ferrofluid was invented for NASA in 1963 by American scientist Steve Papel as a liquid rocket fuel. The idea was that in a zero gravity environment, like space, the fuel, if magnetic, could still be drawn toward a pump inlet. That didn't work out as well as expected. Turns out, ferrofluid contained contaminants we actually wouldn't want in high performance rocket engines. So engineers were able to get the same desired results later using aerosol propellants and elastic sump tanks. But that's not to say ferrofluid doesn't have its own modern practical applications. Well, other than looking cool and dripping all over stuff and playing with magnets. Now, really, truly, and honestly, ferrofluid is so futuristic, it has more potential future applications 
applications than it does present ones, primarily in the biomedical field. Applications such as shuttling medication inside the human body to a specific location using magnetic fields, and utilizing it as a contrast agent in MRI scans. MRI meaning magnetic resonance imaging. You probably already knew that, but if not, I am teaching you all sorts of awesome stuff today. Some engineers and physicists think entire technologies and technological breakthroughs will be caused by ferrofluid experimenting and application. As far as current applications go, they are primarily based on its low friction properties. A ferrofluid seal ensures reduced friction, normally found in mechanical seals. In fact, you use ferrofluids every day. Audio loudspeakers use it to wick heat away from voice coils and keeping out unwanted noise bleed. Sensors and solenoids and accelerometers and flow meters, and ferrofluid is even used as a magnetic seal around the spinning drive shafts and hard disk drives to reduce heat friction and keep out dust and other contaminants that would otherwise crash your hard drives. So you may have some ferrofluid within arm's reach right now and not even know it. Hey guys, please be sure to subscribe to our channel to see new videos every week from Flint Scientific. We really enjoyed making this video for you. Thumbs if you learn anything about ferrofluid and comment below telling me what you'd like to learn about next. All right, see you next week.